I am oh, Professor Elena Foley, and it's my pleasure today to speak with Rita Dove, currently Henry Hoynes Professor of Creative Writing at the University of Virginia. Rita Dove was Poet Laureate of the United States from 1993 to 1995, and is winner of the 1987 Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters and the only poet to receive both the National Humanities Medal and the National Medal of the Arts. Born and raised in Akron, Ohio, she lives near Charlottesville, Virginia with her husband, Fred V. Daybound, and has a daughter, Aviva. These last two personal details will be relevant to our discussion today. Professor Dove is author of many books of poetry and her play, The Darker Face of the Earth, a new version of Sophocles' Oedipus, The King, set in pre-Civil War South, is familiar to many classicists who've taught and written about it. Today, however, we're going to focus on her extraordinary poetry book, Mother Love, which I believe is not as familiar to a classical audience. Mother of Love's seven complex sections respond from many perspectives the De to the Demeter Persephone myth as represented above all in the Homeric hymn to Demeter and Ovid. As author of a book on Homeric hymn to Demeter, who has studied poetic responses to this myth in English poetry, I believe this book is the most outstanding and complex poetic response to the myth known to me. Mother Love was published in 1995, just after I would have had the chance to discuss it in my book. So I'm thrilled to have the chance to explore it with Rita now. Since many of our lip listeners may not be as familiar with Mother Love or read it recently, I'm asking Rita to begin by reading two poems, especially beloved by my students, that touch directly on the Demeter and Persephone myth. The first one, Narcissus Flower, responds directly to ancient versions, whereas the longer poem, The Bistro Sticks, deals with a critical transition in a very different Demeter and Persephone relation eventually represented in this complicated poetry book. So Rita, if you could share those poems with us. Helena, I'm delighted to, and I'm delighted to be here to be able to discuss this uh, this version of, or of the myth of uh, which you. So I will begin with the first um, poem, which is called The Narcissus Flower. I remember my foot in its frivolous slipper, a frightened bird, not the earth unzipped, but the way I could see my own fingers and hear myself scream as the blossom incinerated. And though nothing could chasten the plunge, this man adamant as a knife easing into the humblest crevice, I found myself at the center of a calm so pure it was hate. The mystery is you can eat fear before fear eats you. You can live beyond dying and become a queen whom nothing surprises. So that occurs very early in the book, obviously, and it's, of course, that moment of, of the abduction. Um, and But the second one that Helena has asked me to read is, um, as you see, a, a more modern version of this, and it's told from the mother's point of view. The Bistro Sticks. She was thinner with a mannered gauntness as she paused just inside the double glass doors to survey the room, silvery cape billowing dramatically behind her. What's this, I thought, lifting a hand until she nodded and started across the parquet. That's when I saw she was dressed all in gray from a kittenish cashmere skirt and cowl down to the graphite signature of her shoes. Sorry I'm late, she panted, though she wasn't. Sliding into the chair, her cape tossed off in a shudder of brushed steel. 
we kissed. Then I leaned back to peruse my blighted child, this wary aristocratic mole. How's business, I asked, and hazarded a motherly smile to keep from crying out, are you content to conduct your life as a cliche and what's worse, an anachronism, the brooding artist's demi-monde? Near the Rue Princesse, they had opened a gallery home souvenir shop, which featured fuzzy off-color Monet's next to his acrylics, no doubt plus bearded African drums and the occasional miniature gargoyle from Notre Dame the great artist had carved at breakfast with a pocket knife. Tourists love us, the Parisians, of course, she blushed, are amused, though not without a certain admiration. The Chateaubriand arrived on a bone white plate smug and absolute in its fragrant crust, a black plug steaming like the heart plucked from the chest of a worthy enemy. One touch with her fork sent pink juices streaming. Admiration for what? Wine, a bloody Pinot Noir brought color to her cheeks. Why, the aplomb with which we've managed to support our art meaning he'd convinced her to pose nude for his appalling canvases, faintly futuristic landscapes strewn with car wrecks and bodies being chewed by rabid cocker spaniels. I'd like to come by the studio, I ventured, and see the new stuff. Yes, if you wish, a delicate rebuff before the warning. He dresses all in black now. Me, he drapes in blues and carmine, and even though I think it's kind of cute, in company I tend toward more muted shades. She paused and had the grace to drop her eyes. She did look ravishing, spookily insubstantial, a lipstick ghost on tissue, or as if one stood on a fifth floor terrace peering through a fringe of rain at Paris's dreaming chimney pots, each sooty issue wobbling skyward in an ecstatic oracular spiral. And he never thinks of food. I wish I didn't have to plead with him to eat. Fruit and cheese appeared, arrayed on leaf green dishes. I stuck with Café Crème. This camembert is so ripe, she joked. It's practically grown hair. Mucking a golden glob complete with parsley sprig onto a heel of bread. Nothing seemed to fill her up. She swallowed, sliced into a pear, speared each tear-shaped lavalier, and popped the dripping mess into her pretty mouth. Nowhere the bright tufted fields, weighted vines and sun poured down out of the south. But are you happy? Fearing, I whispered it quickly. What? You know, mother, she bit into the starry rose of a fig. One really should try the fruit here. I've lost her, I thought, and called for the bill. Okay, I hope that's whetted everybody's appetites if you haven't been reading Mother of Love recently. Um, uh, but anyway, um, I'd like to turn from here where I think the combination of these two poems together uh, really set up some larger uh, questions that I wanted to be able to ask you. And first of all, in terms of um, overall themes relating to the Demeter and Persephone myth, um, both Ovid and the Homer came to Demeter end with an emphasis on the mother-daughter and familial and divine re reunification, as well as a stabilized nature on earth. By contrast, Persephone eventually almost disappears from the whole myth, um, for, from your whole poem, mm -hmm. and the final move to the wretched modern traces of the myth in Sicily um, <clears throat> goes beyond the myth altogether to the modern world and yourself and your husband 
um, on a tourist trip. <laughs> so I'd love you to talk a little bit more about this overall overall thematic um, shift in your take on the Demeter Persephone myth. Well, you know, for me, uh, one of the crucial, uh, the, I guess, driving forces when I began writing these poems was uh, how the myths can relate to um, modern life and and how we, uh, why they are so intriguing even now. And so in terms of this myth, uh, the mother and the daughter, uh, it, it felt like there, there was no ending, no, let's say, neat ending uh, where uh, everything is restored to a, a, the, the order of the universe. And of course, Demeter um, then does her thing and gives us agriculture and gives us everything for, for six months out of the year and then mourns for the other half and then winter comes. But I, I, I as the more that I wrote these poems, I realized that uh, I wanted to grasp both the mother side and the daughter side because a mother was once a daughter too. And, uh, and it, the cycle keeps continuing. It, it felt to me, and it was only at the very end, uh, Helena, that I um, realized that I had to step out of the confines of the myth as we know it and step into the modern day and place myself in the myth it, it, it itself. And, and in fact, this, this tourist trip was my, with which my husband and I did make uh, was done before I mean, well, it was done after I had finished most of the poems in the book. I, I did not want to to step into my world until I had uh, felt that I had walked uh, both the myth in terms of the Homeric myth, myth in terms of Ovid, but also the, the myth that I was internalizing in the book. And so it wasn't until I was pretty much finished with everything that I went and said, okay, now let's find this spot and let's connect with the physical evidence of the myth. And uh, it, it it was a way of also bringing that myth into the modern era, stepping into it and, and having the reader feel that all of these uh, emotions that are going on and all of these connections and complications between mother, daughter, uh, consort, innocence and, uh, and, and experience, that they in fact do resonate quite deeply with the human beings walking the earth today. Okay, thanks so much. Sure. Um, so I think I, I think that gives us a good start on some of the major themes. And for myself, because I've read the book many times now, um, I'm really fascinated with the way the whole structure of the book of poetry fits together, which is very complicated. And I, I know that you had actually started to publish some of these poems before it sort of emerged as um, mother love eventually. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how the, the structure of the book developed and how the different parts fit together for readers who are reading it for the first time. It's so interesting to, to think back on it because um, when I think back on the way the book was put together, and uh, my memory may fail me at moments, so we'll have to be patient. But um, I, I think that a lot of it, it developed so, or I don't want to say organically, because that sounds like there was a plan. There was no plan. I mean, I, I wanted to write. I, I love the sonnets to Orpheus, real sonnets to Orpheus, mm -hmm. and I wanted to write something that was also a, sonnets to a, a goddess, not to a god, um, or not to a human being, but a, a female entity. And uh, I, I thought they they really need to be, I really felt that there was a connection I wanted to do. I do not, I can't tell you why or how I decided that uh, that I was going to write something about the Persephone and Demeter myth, except that I do know that I have to trust my instincts at times, and that's what I did. I started writing poems. I did not start at the beginning. Um, I uh, 
I, I just, I, but if, near the beginning, I started near that whole, uh, the whole abduction. But um, the poems are written wildly out of order. I was really interested in 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 how to make that feeling of both praise and mourning. I think that often comes in to a sonnet. It may be a, a sonnet, may be a thing of a, a poem that is directed to one person and is is meant to be full of full of love, if not about love. But at the same time, there's always a loss. I think somewhere underneath that. So these were my concerns. Um, my daughter was very young at the time. And when she was uh, reading, she had one of these books, children's books of myths that she was looking through. And I remember one day she walked into my study and she said, you're writing about us. Because I mean, I, I kept an open door. And so I had been talking to my husband, Fred, about these poems that were coming out and uh she said you're writing about us and then off she went and it took you know the, the voice <laughs> of a child to make me realize that that's why I was drawn to this she was becoming a an individual she was a, a child but she was becoming an individual and already the process of feeling loss was beginning in me as a mother um so up until that point, I think I always thought of myself as a daughter. You know, my mother was still alive at the time. And uh, and I was the daughter who had the first daughter who had had a child, all of these things. But now suddenly I was a mother who had this child who I could not protect all the time. So that's how it started. Um, they began to... Um, from the very beginning, I think I was very interested in, in, in finding then those parallels between our, our, our life today. Uh, how does a, a mother feel today? How does an abduction today, how, or how do we deal with it, cope with it? Um, because I, I did not want this to, these poems to feel like, uh, a poetic equivalent of a historical drama, you know, where everyone just sits back and goes, oh yeah, there they go, the gods, uh, tra you know, trailing their robes. I wanted people to feel them and say, oh, this is life here. We have missing children on milk cartons, right? Um, or, 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 you know, our daughters grow up. A and the more I began to write these poems and the sonnet was helping me immensely, incidentally, the whole working with the son it, it, I love the son anyway we'll talk about that later I think but um but the more I read the more I realized that the thing that troubled me the most about this myth was the fact that Persephone eats the pomegranate seeds and up to that point she had you know you know of course according to um um some versions of the myth Hades tricked her, you know, by slipping her these, these, but she didn't have to eat them, you know, and so I kept thinking, why? Why did she eat them? What does that mean uh, in the context of the myth? Uh, it, it, I felt that it meant more than just a plot device so that we could explain away seasons. And the more I wrote, the more I realized that there's also this element of of a, of a daughter growing up and that 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 moment of a daughter turning away from the mother and turning toward the lover um the husband the consort whatever was was also a very profound moment that um uh, i wanted to explore hence um this moment in the bistro sticks where um uh, persephone has the uh, the the cliche of the uh, the artist's muse, so to speak. Yeah, great, fantastic. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to um, also, since you are somebody who has spent a lot of time in lots of places in the world, including Germany, and I'm guessing France, although I don't know. Yes, um, <laughs> um, which perhaps some of Persephone's experiences come from. Um, in this poem, 
Could you talk a little bit more about your identity as a a traveling poet or a traveling person from many different environments in relation to this myth, which also involves a traveling between different worlds? That's, that's a great question. Um, yes, I have traveled a lot and I did spend quite a lot of time in uh, Paris and in France. Um, and a lot of the details that come into the, the Parisian sections of this are um, because Paris is, has become hell and in, in a certain way, yes. poor, poor Paris, um, is, uh, I think, it, and first of all, just to say, I think in terms of the, the mother's eyes, Paris is hell because it is the place of love and it's the place where people, where her daughter gets lost. I don't think of Paris as being, you know, awful or anything like that. But a lot of the details um, from that thing come from, the that that feeling of uh, the the kind of what do you say culture mores that that I observed while I was in Paris. I my French is abysmal, and so I though I spent though we spent my husband and I spent about about uh, on on several occasions about five or six weeks in Paris. Uh, I my feeling was that of an exile. I mean, I could not really communicate with anyone. I could observe, but I couldn't really communicate. Now, I've traveled a lot through the world, and, and the only other language that I know um, that I'm fluent in is German. But um, so that means that that through all of these travels, either I'm talking in English or some kind of uh, mixture of all sorts of languages. And that feeling of displacement, of wandering, of being able to observe and watch and these little sparks of communication, that is something that that I think um, I've, I've experienced quite a bit and does make a, a, has an undertone in this book and in fact, in this myth, because uh, of course, Demeter starts to wander the earth once she's looking for her daughter after she- yeah daughter's been abducted she uh, goes down to earth and disguises herself takes on the appearance of a mortal and wanders and that um that that i i knew that kind of wandering it's, it's interesting so so that's part of it it's also part of the fact that that i think that that um the ways in which we as 24 First, are we in the 21st century? Yes, tw- whatever century we're in. The 21st century um, human beings, the ways in which we can relate to myths like these. Um, it, it, in a way, we have to become a wanderer. We have to wander into the myth. We have to you know, find touchstones with it and let it resonate. And that was sort of a way the process in which I worked through this book it it felt only then inevitable in the end to uh, end the book with a a classic kind of tourist uh, wandering um, literally around the island of Sicily looking for the exact spot where Persephone has been uh, has been drawn into the underworld but um, certainly that that whole experience of wandering and watching and observing as a poet has filtered into the work. Could you, I know um, our first two poems had a little more about Persephone in a way than Demeter. So could you talk a little bit more about the Demeter figure for you and her many incarnations um, in the poem as a whole and how you configured that <laughs> yeah uh, well yes you know the, it begins of course the, the book begins all all it's persephone you know she's being abducted and it's from her point of view she, she's kind of growing up and then more and more what demeter does what she how she reacts to things and how her environment reacts to things becomes important i i, I began to step more and more into that role of the mother and there there are several poems where where uh, more contemporary more contemporary versions where uh instead of gods trying to convince the goddess to 
get back to her work and take care of the earth in terms of our agriculture and not let everything go to waste, um, we have a, a whole neighborhood of Black women trying to decide what to do with this person who refuses to give up mourning and who refuses uh, you know, to uh, turn back to life and to get on with her life. Because how the various ways in which we deal with grief as human beings is, uh, I think, exemplified so wonderfully with the whole myth of Demeter because she, there she is, a goddess. She just says, no, I'm not going to, to um, follow the rules or the laws or whatever. I am in mourning. I refuse to do anything else. And so that, the, I became fascinated by the idea. Here was this, uh, in this in this whole patriarchal, I guess you could say, system of of gods of gods and uh, our deities. Here was one. Here was a woman or a female deity who said, "Uh, uh-uh, I ain't doing it," and and she disrupts it. She really, literally um, manages to get. Zeus to say, okay, I'll talk to my brother and see what I can do. And I think the power that she has, the power by insisting on her right to suffer, to grieve, it became fascinating to me. It really became fascinating to me. So that's one of the things that that she gets stronger and stronger. And, and Demeter's way of dealing with the loss you know, first of all, refusing it at the same time, also saying that even after her daughter comes back, she says, you will never forget. I can never forget this pain. I can never forget what she's gone through. Part of that is because, you know, as a, as a woman, she knows what one can go through. And um, that, I think, mirrored in a certain way my personal coming to terms with the fact that that I, I could not protect my daughter from everything and that she was going to be hurt at some point and she was going to suffer and I could do what I could do, you know, for my end. But in the end, I was powerless. Uh, and so I, I needed to figure out how do you also save yourself um, in this. And uh, so it was part of my growing up as a, as a mother, I guess you could say. That's great. Um, I know you mentioned two poems that I especially loved while you were talking about this. Um, and I, um, you, you were mentioning grief, the council, the group of women who were there to be Demeter's mourners. <laughs> and one of the things I loved about that poem was the fact that you created that community of women who, in the hymn to Demeter at least, help Demeter deal with her grief and sorrow with her daughters. Mm -hmm. So would would you be willing to just read that poem for us too? Oh yeah, sure, absolutely. Let me see if I can have one. Here it is. This poem is um, it it has for the for those of you out there who don't have it in front of you or anything, there are two voices and it's kind of staggered on the page. So you have a um, the voices of the the women, the older women, and you also have. A, a kind of a, I guess you could say it's Demeter's thoughts as she's going through these process. Grief, the council. I told her enough is enough. Get a hold on yourself. Take a lover, help some other unfortunate child. To abdicate, to let the garden go to seed. Yes, it's a tragedy, a low down shame, but you still got your own life to live. Meanwhile, ain't nothing we can do but be discreet and wait. She brightened up a bit then. I thought of those blurred snapshots framed on milk cartons, a new pair each week. Soot drifting up from hell, dusting the kale's green tresses, the corn's green sleeve. It was pathetic. I bet she ain't took in a word I said except that last, like a dog with a chicken bone too greedy to care if it stick in his gullet and choke him sure. 
and no design. I say we got to see her through. I say she can't be left too long in that grafty old house alone. No end of day delight at the creek of the gate. Sister Jeffries, you could drop in tomorrow morning, take one of your mason jars, something Swedish, tomatoes or bell peppers. No tender cheek nor ripening grape destined for wine. Miss Earl can fetch her later to the movies. A complicated plot should distract her, something with a car chase through Manhattan, loud horns melting to a strings and sax ending. The last frail tendril snapped free, though the roots still strain toward her. And your basic sunshine pouring through the clouds. Ain't this crazy weather? Feels like winter coming on. At last the earth cleared to the sea. At last composure. Great, thank you. And the other one I think you were mentioning was Demeter Morning. Ah, oh, yes, yes. Um, so maybe that would be fun to share also. Yeah, that would be a good one to share because this is, um, we're coming to terms with things and I'll just read it. Demeter Morning. Nothing can console me. You may bring silk to make skin sigh, dispense yellow roses in the manner of ripened dignitaries. You can tell me repeatedly I am unbearable, and I know this. Still, nothing turns the gold to corn. Nothing is sweet to the tooth crushing in. I'll not ask for the impossible. One learns to walk by walking. In time, I'll forget this empty brimming. I may laugh again at a bird, perhaps, chucking the nest. But it will not be happiness, for I have known that. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I don't know whether you want to talk about this or not, because I, I asked you whether you might be interested, but... Since we have a little time, um, I thought I would ask you, there's some certainly feminist elements in the poem, <laughs> um, which I wondered if you could comment a little bit on your perspectives in relation to that. Well, sure. Um, there are definitely feminist elements in the poem. I mean, I felt that I felt that as I was I was proceeding or, or it, through the myth and getting wrapped up in the myth that it in many ways what Demeter accomplishes through her strike in a way you know is a a, a grasp of power and it's a, it's a grasp of feminist power I also felt that the to though the 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 let's say the the Homeric hymns and the Ovid don't focus on or delve into the emotions behind the actions. In other words, how does how how this woman feels, how this goddess feels about having her daughter abducted, and how the daughter feels about being abducted. The facts are just there. There there are there there are still a few moments of of great terror in in, in terms of of um, Persephone. Uh, as they talk about how you know there are some details which often don't come up in in these uh, depictions of of rape and abduction that happens so often uh, in the Greek myths uh, with her torn dress you, you know in the Homeric uh, versions now but there's just enough of an indication there's great anguish there and there's also great power that's being um, earned or rested, I guess you could say, wrenched out by uh, the goddess because she manages to get the all-powerful Zeus to um, actually talk to his brother. And, and that brother actually agrees, more or less, 
okay, oh, I'll, I'll give her back. So that's, that's quite a power play. Um, and so I thought that there are two things that I really wanted to, that I really felt were important in that. First of all, just the sheer act of being able to get the daughter back and to insist that that grieving is not something to be ashamed of or to be put aside, you know, in terms of efficiency or anything like that. But um, also that the the lot the, the 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 emotion that the emotion both of these women felt the the both the daughter and the mother and their relationship and how it begins to change all of that 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 was very important and and that was something that had not been given its due in terms of of these myths and so in that sense I think it was uh there's quite a few feminist elements in, in the book we just kind of kind of rise up through it um, yes yeah well we could spend more time on that <clears throat> but um one of the main things I wanted to ask you because this is something that you're very interested in your poetry as a whole is the sonic <laughs> form <clears throat> which you use and adapt in various ways and <clears throat> mother love and you say in your introduction I would simply say that I like how the sonnet comforts, even while it's prim borders, parentheses, what a pretty fence, end of parentheses, are stultifying. One is constantly bumping up against order. The Demeter Persephone cycle of betrayal and recognition is ideally suited for this form since all three, mother goddess, daughter concert, and poet are struggling to sing in their chains, end quote. So I'd like you to talk a little bit more on, on your amazing use of the form of the sonnet in this poem, and maybe turn to some reading of your use of the sonnet form in part seven, where you go to Sicily. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Um, well, I think that, that first of all, I believe that writing in form um, is, one cannot let the form dictate the content and you can't let the content dictate the form. I mean, in other words, they should be so of a piece that um, that we're not aware of one or the other, you know, in terms of it, its, its effect. Um, to that end, also believing that that when the use of the Petrarchan sonnet or the Shakespearean sonnet are also predicated on the languages and the dictions that uh, were prevalent in the day, uh, we have far many more contractions. English is not Italian. Therefore, um, some different kinds of rhythms and cadences should be allowed into the, the sonnet. And so that's basically what I did. And I think you can hear some of those you might be going, well, where's the sonnet in them? Every once in a while, it seems like a, a, a rhyme pops up. Uh, most of them do have off rhymes. Uh, and, uh, but, and, and for instance, in the Bistro, Bistro Sticks, it's, I think, about five uh, 14 line units that are put together and which rhyme, though not necessarily in Shakespearean or Petrarchan sense. There, um, I, I felt that the sonnet, form itself sometimes could lead me into a, a realization it would it would open up a, a channel to my subconscious that that I had been uh, hiding from myself and I think we all hide things from ourselves I mean you you no one wants to go into pain and to write about pain no one wants to go to write about fear um and uh, or maybe want to write about want to write about it in a way that you can control the sonnet. Oddly enough, with all of its formal controls, helped me have something to hold on to so that I could go into things that I could not control, which are emotions such as in Demeter or Demeter Morning, where where she says, you know, I you know, I may laugh but it won't be happiness because I've known that. And the fact that she said that that, that last line was a, 
a revelation for me and 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 struck me very deeply because I realized, yes, that's what it is. Sometimes you can be happy that something has turned out okay, but the 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 loss and the grief is still there and and absolute happiness was perhaps when you were a child and that's that's gone forever so that sense of the sauna that did kind of lead me uh, along um and I discovered too as I was writing that I never looked for a rhyme you know they just they they happened and uh I I don't know I, I lived and breathed sonnets it was it was great um the last section, however, and you had asked me to talk about that, and I'll, I'll read a little bit of it so people can see what I'm doing. Uh, I, I decided as a a kind of a closure to the to everything to go to Sicily now and to, to look at that, um, the place where uh, supposedly Persephone had been abducted. And my original intention was maybe I could get a closing poem out of it. I did not intend for it to become a crown of sonnets. And now a crown of sonnets, uh, as many of your, the, the audience probably know, is, is, a, is a particularly torturous form where you have linked sonnets and the last line of one sonnet becomes the first line of the next. And so, and at the very end, the... Um, the first line of the very first sonnet becomes the end of the very last sonnet, thus closing the, the circle and making it into a crown. I didn't know that I was going to do that, except that as we started out on our trip and we, we had a rental car, and we really literally drove counterclockwise around the island of Sicily. We were both sightseeing and at the same time we were going to get to the uh the site where Persephone was abducted. Uh the 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 crown began to happen. I thought what more apt application of a crown of sonnets, but to actually move in a circle around this island. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to read, uh, I'll read, um, I'm, sure I'm trying to decide. I'm going to read these, uh, a, a couple of sonnets so you can hear the, the crown part of it, how it works. And this is the moment uh, prior to and right as we discover the, uh, the Persephone abduction site. So we've been traveling all along Sicily. Um, Everywhere temples or pieces of them lay scattered across the countryside, the, these monstrous broken sticks flung astride in a celestial bout of I Ching have become Sicily's most exalted litter. The lesser kind flies out the windows of honking automobiles. We circle the island, trailing the sun on his daily rounds, turning time back in one infernal story, a girl pulled into a lake, one perfect oval hemmed all around by reeds at the center of the physical world. We turn inland as if turning a page in a novel, dry splash of the cicada, no breath from the sea. Dry splash of the cicada, no breath from the sea. Our maps have failed us, have not failed us. This is it, the only body of water for 20 miles, water black and still as the breath it harbored. And around this perfect ellipse, they've built a racetrack. Bleachers, pit stops, a 10 foot fence plastered with ads, castrol, campari, and looped barbed wire, no way to get near. We drive the circumference with binoculars, no cave, no reeds. We drive it twice, first one way, then back to cancel our rage at the human need to make a sport of death. So that is not the end of the crown, but then it goes on to make a sport of death. It must be endless. And uh, <laughs> that's the moment, yeah. 
Yeah, it's amazing. Um, as I as I told you when we were corresponding before this, um, I had a very very similar experience to you <laughs> in Sicily. I I went to see find the very same place and was equally disappointed to see it ruined by a racetrack. So amazing. But, yes. Um, I'm. I imagine many other people in this audience have probably had a similar experience if they attempted to do the same thing. And I told you in an email that I hope you someday go to Eleusis because even though it's a ruin, it's a little less depressing. It's a little... <laughs> <laughs> I have been there. You're right. You're right. It's a little less depressing, but this one was, yeah. But at the same time, I also felt that, uh, you know, this is where the sonnet helped me too, because this is extreme disappointment, this racetrack, but it was a circle within a circle and I was writing these sonnets and they were going counterclockwise and they were turning time back or trying to turn time back, you know, not good. And uh, so the, the form itself was a consolation at that moment. Yeah. I was a brilliant consolation and a wonderful surprise at the end of the poem. Um, so um, is there anything else you'd like to share with us about what you, looking back on this book, especially found important to share with with readers gee um uh, we've covered so much and it's been really great I, I it was wonderful for me to be able to to go back to it and to read the book again from beginning to end because of course I haven't done that in a long time and um um and to see how it moved I I was I, I think that it's also important to know that the book is, as you said, this, there are seven sections and they um, they do progress in, a, in interesting ways, I think. And I think that it's, it's interesting that though the whole myth as we know it is kind of chronicled up to the point of, of number section seven, which then becomes completely uh, uh, contemporary. That that there are also that the the contemporary and the the classic are mixed throughout. Uh, you know that there are some poems like Golden Oldies, which is completely contemporary. It's pretty early in the book, um, and then there are poems which are very classic, like Demeter's Prayer to Hades, uh, which is at the very end of section six. So uh, I try to keep this wandering, uh, you know, between those those two poles all the time. But this has been great to talk about. Oh, well, thank you so much. This has really been inspiring <laughs> to get a chance to talk to you. Having taught this poem many times, my students are wildly enthusiastic about it. And their favorite is the bistro sticks over time. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that fits them very well as young women in the work experiencing a larger world, <laughs> which you could characterize as Hades at times, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like yes. Paris with all the dirt, the turds on the on oh, the street. Now the little dog <laughs> <turd. Paris. laughs> <laughs> So thank you so much. Um, it's really been a pleasure, and I've learned so much from listening to you about this.